All right, it is 7.34 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. Good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Venkat Holly. Here. Good to have you all. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli is unavailable to join us this evening, and the board currently has a vacancy. Um, town officials on the call. Uh, Rick Valorelli, the board's administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And uh, Vincent Lee, the assisting staff. Good to have you, Vinny. I know you're having some audio problems there. Um, appearing on behalf of the um, Remote Participation Study Committee. Is there anyone here from that group at this time? Ah, Jennifer Seuss is here. Good to see you. See you. Uh, representing 39 Woodside Lane, uh, Mary O'Connor is here. Yes. And I saw Paul Lassard is here as well. Uh, appearing on behalf of 13 Edith Street. Uh, Jack Foster, present. See you. Um, and then on behalf of 24 Langley Road. Faith Baum, I'm here. Good to see you. Okay. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals of the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotony, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So at the start of this meeting, um, I'm gonna quickly uh, just drop down and open up um, the hearing for 39 Woodside Lane uh, because the applicant uh, has a request to continue. Um, so Mary O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, we would request that the continued hearing that's on tonight for 39 Woodside Lane be continued to November 15th due to an unforeseen family medical emergency suffered by a member of our construction and architectural team. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Are there any questions from the board? Then uh, may I have a motion to continue the special permit hearing for 39 Woodside Lane? until 7.30 p.m. on October 15th, 
Mr. November. Chairman, that's not October 15th. It would mm -hmm. be November 15th. Oh, thank you so much. November 15th. Thank you. Second. Uh, so this is or a so moved, whichever is appropriate. Um, so this will be a vote to continue the special permit hearing for 39 Woodside Lane till November 15th, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, so roll call vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 39 Woodside Lane. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. So with that, I'll return back to the administrative items. We're starting this evening with a couple of administrative items. Uh, the first is the approval of written minutes for September 13th. And the second will be a discussion of the board's participation in the hybrid meeting pilot. Uh, to expedite the consideration of these items, the chair notes the following. Uh, these items relate to the operation of the board and as such will be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. So with that um, item two on our agenda is the approval of the meeting minutes from, I had said September 13th, I apologize, it is September 27th, 2022. These were minutes that were prepared by Mr. Valerelli, distributed to the board for comment. Um, everyone should have had an opportunity to review and return comments to uh, Mr. Valerelli. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written minutes for September 27th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from September 27th, 2022. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, and a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, roll call vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, aye. Mr. Um, Mr. Riccadelli is not with us this evening, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. This brings us to item number three, um, which is a discussion with the Remote Participation Study Committee. So with that, I'd introduce Jennifer Seuss. And um, Hi, good, good to see you. Uh, so uh, I'll sort of give a brief uh, presentation of what we've done so far and what we hope to do in the next few months and then open the floor to questions. So um, as, as you likely know, since you've read about it, you, since you read it at the beginning of your meetings, um, the remote order is extended until March 31st. Now, what happens in March 31st, we don't know. Um, the legislature is often does things at the last minute. Um, there's lots of backdoor stuff. Uh, some possibilities include uh, going back to the way it was before, those rules were that the only reason that you could be remote was either that you're physically out of town or there was a medical emergency. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that they passed legislation requiring some sort of hybrid meetings or encouraging it, or there's a date later to, you know, there, so there, there's a lot of discussion about hybrid meetings. Um, and then a third possibility is that they just keep pushing it because they haven't made the decision and which is possible. Um, so, uh, but but what happens, so so what we're doing now though, um, so a year and a half ago, a town meeting passed uh, this remote participation study committee that designed to study actually hybrid meeting technology and protocols. And um, in the first year, we spent a lot of time uh, talking to people, both participants in meetings and um, people on committees uh, via surveys and some them also just conversations, um, gathering information, uh, putting together a report for a town meeting about what we want to do. And it made sense to do a um, pilot rather than sort of launch full, full fledged into this <laughs> for, for reasons I'm sure you understand. Um, and so we reached out to several committees, yours included, and asked if they'd be interested in being part of the pilot. Now, I actually don't remember if you guys have voted to be part of the pilot or if that's still to be done. Do, do you remember? Great question. Um, okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I know so, we had discussed it, and I believe we were in agreement that we would want to do so, but I don't think we had had done uh, a formal vote. had a formal vote or not. Okay. So, so if you're still willing to go forward, um, you would need a formal vote at some point. But um, 
So, uh, so the the hybrid uh, pilot, you know, best of intentions, we'd want to start a couple months ago uh, for various reasons. Where we we have a much shorter time period, um, but in the ideal world, we would start this hybrid with you guys if you're still interested sometime in um, November. And if that's just not possible, so December would be fine as well. Um, there's a few things that you as a committee have to do before we start the pilot. One is certainly to have a vote. Um, but the other is to go through that decision point document, which I, I know you've seen, and mm -hmm. make some crucial decisions about how you want to run your meetings. Yep. And we didn't want to sort of uh, tell committees how to run the meetings. We wanted to sort of just talk about the kinds of issues that might arise. Okay. The most important issue is what happens in the case of technical failure. Right. So if you have technical failure and you don't have a quorum in either place, so there's a, people in a room and then people online and there's not quorum either place, mm -hmm. what happens? A uh, couple of possibilities, few possibilities. One is you could um, shut down the meeting and restart in a couple of hours or an hour or something and give people time to get to someplace, either all remote or all in person. <laughs> um, another possibility is to um, have a date that you've set in advance that you would reconvene. Mm -hmm. um, and a third possibility is, is to continue with the meeting, but of course it would only be possible if you had a quorum in one place. We, we uh, had so, touched on these topics briefly at the end of our last session. Great, so we, great. So we do have some responses for some of these questions. Oh, great. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, what, do you, what are you guys thinking of right now, just a curiosity? So for that, what we had discussed was that we would, we would want to have a, um, that there would be a pause for like mm -hmm. 15 minutes to just see yep. if it could resolve itself. Yep. Um, but that if it couldn't, we would adjourn to a future date. Um, just because chances yeah. are the reason that the call is going out is because there's a snowstorm or there's lightning or something. And so we don't want to encourage people to go out on the road. Or there's random internet outages on town hall sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> or you know, the community center has been problematically. So, so there exactly. could be weird things like that. So one of the things with being part of a pilot is that you are going to get more problems than hopefully we have in the future. I mean, that's the point yeah. of being a part of a pilot is to stress test these things. And so there might be more technical problems or protocol problems and your feedback is really going to be important to us okay. um the kind of feedback we're looking for we have a serve a really quick survey we're asked two kinds one is uh the chair or the chair designee sort of we're, we're sort of requiring that person to uh fill that out after every meeting and the other survey questionnaire is to be sent out to board members and members of the public to be filled out at their discretion so no one has to, so we have to have at least one person filling out, but the other one, the shorter one can be filled out people as they want. So, so if you have people who are participating remotely by Zoom, that's very easy, you can put it in the chat. Um, and, and, and then if you have it in person, uh, you might have to do, have like a physical piece of paper or something um, to give to people to, to fill it out. Mm. Yeah, or some sort of, well, we'll yeah. Um, okay, so the other sort of questions to ask is how do you handle public participation? So you have some people on Zoom, some people in the room. What do you do? Do you go back and forth? Do you handle one at, at a time? Um, do you have a sign up that happens in advance or like at the very beginning of a meeting? So you want you want to sort of figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we love that this meeting is being is interested in being part of the pilot because you do have lots and lots of interest in the public. So you will be testing sort of public participation, both remotely and in person. And that's gonna be great for us <laughs> to get information from you. Um, you guys are gonna be, I think you know, in the community center um, in room A or B. Those, that's the big room that can be divided with the divider. Okay, yeah. Um, yep. Uh, there, there have been like weird little problems. So I do suggest that people, um, that, that somebody uh, sort of be trained, certainly in the technology, but also just in the room layout before the meeting starts. And so mm -hmm. I know that you have a staff person um, and that that person would be trained first, but I'd also suggest that somebody else um, from your committee be trained as well. Um, for little things like, where's the key? Or I know there's a little like, you know, mm -hmm. remote control box, where is it? I mean, not, um, everything has to be plugged in. Nothing's on batteries, for example, like little, little things that could go wrong. Um, it's good to sort of test those things out first. Um, let's see the other, there's one more major, um, um, zoom. 
Yeah, I mean, you have to you you have to figure out who's doing what. So you know, you have a staff person, but do you have um, somebody who's handling the remote stuff in the room? Somebody who's handling Zoom hand raises somewhere else? Or you know, you, you sort of have to designate the people who are in charge of that. Um, I mean, you are lucky because you have staff people in in your meeting, but um, but it might be helpful to have a member who's just making sure everyone gets in and, ra and raise the hands and stuff like that. Um, who's not doing the on in room stuff? I'm just seeing. I thought there was one more big thing. Um, I think that's basically it. But I do want to say one more thing. When you're in the room, the ca the camera follows you and it it picks up sound. And it's pretty good. Um, but if somebody speaks in the room, one of the things you don't get is you don't get their name in the in the way box. So if you want to capture that, you will need to the speaker will need to say their name. And certainly that has to happen if it's a member of the public anyway, but you mm -hmm. might decide that it makes sense for committee members also, commission members also to say their name. I mean, we didn't do that in the olden days, but it might, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, we certainly get that information captured on remote and Zoom. And so it might be valuable to do that as well in the room, but okay. it's up to you. Yeah. Would we okay. be able to schedule just sort of like a dry run? That's yes. not an actual meeting? Okay. Absolutely. So, um, so Jim Feeney is running these, and right. rather than trying to schedule everyone at the same time, he just said, "Reach out to him and and work oh. with him." So you can reach out to him through me, or you can reach out to him on your own. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays are good days for him in general. Okay. So um, those are good days to just go down and hang out for a few minutes in those rooms. Okay. Yeah. That might be instructive, you know, for. A because a lot of what we do has such importance that, you know, I would hate to sort of try this out for the first time on some poor unsuspecting applicants. So right. um, mm -hmm. if we could try it out, you know, once or twice, just among friends and family, we could probably try to make that work and see what happens. Yeah, I say I would, I would suggest that you do a trial run beforehand for 15 minutes or something, but then also start the meeting a few minutes early to sort of go through that before they... Okay. Um, obviously, you can't you know, discuss anything official, but, you, but yeah. just that kind of, you know, you can ask people okay. about their dinner plans or something. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, just a couple more things that some committees are doing. Some committees are coming up. I mean, you said you've already had a discussion, but some committees have like a subgroup that is making, going through the decision point document and sort of presenting things to the committee for suggestions. But it sounds like you've already sort of talked about some of those things. Yeah. Um, and, and I would just stress that what you want to do is make sure that the public knows what the decisions are. Right. right. So both at both ideally in your um, agenda, also in um, at the beginning of each of the meetings. You know, here's what happens in case we have a technical failure. This is what we're going to do. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Are so there... questions. Yes. Let's say any questions from the board. Sorry, I'm <clears throat> mute. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, do we have, in the ordinary run of meetings, there's probably no reason why we sh shouldn't have them in the community center. Uh, there are occasional cases where we can expect a very crowded room. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for public health reasons, if no other, it would might be a good idea to do those all Zoom rather than rather than have a lot of people coming together for a COVID event? And I guess I'm wondering what, how we would do that. I assume that we have the ability to sort of, in an exceptional case, make clear in the public notice that the, or right. something that the meeting will be an all Zoom meeting if that's what we've decided to do. But have you thought through the procedure, how, how that would work if, if we elected on on special occasions to go all Zoom, or I suppose alternatively, even all personal maybe. So in terms of the feedback to, on the pilot, we're getting less feedback if you do that. But of course, you're right that it might make sense to do that. Um, what I would recommend you do is, especially if you've not made that crystal clear to, to potential outside members, is have them one person in the room, just in case. But but if you I mean if, if it's it's all been announced in advance and it's really clear, then you probably can continue to go on Zoom. The great thing about the fact that the order doesn't expire until March 31st 
is that legally we can do anything we want right now, right? So we we might very well have some much more restrictive requirements whenever that remote participation order expires. But right now it's wide open. You know, the difficulty is apt to come up most in 40B cases because before you even have anybody from the public, you have a room that's half full of experts of one sort or the other from each side. Yeah. And when you begin, and then, you know, uh, some are more controversial than others, but if you have a lot of people, it's not too hard to be in a position where everybody is sort of tightly squeezed together, which is still not something that a lot of people are comfortable with. So I have a second question, Mr. Chairman, if it's all right. Please. I just want to be clear that as I understand it, the technical issue is, is, that, is that it doesn't require any vote of the board. In other words, if, if you wait 15 minutes and then nothing happens, then you already have preposition in order that says what is going to occur. So that if anybody stays on the phone for 15 minutes and nothing happens, then they know that they're gonna to have to go to the backup day. And we don't have to worry about somehow finding a quorum to act because we've already acted. There's a default option and it doesn't require anything more from our part. And that, that understanding is correct about how the procedure would work, isn't it? Yes, at least that's what our intention is. We have stated as our intention. Yeah, that's that's we did it that way. Yeah, that's, that's what we understand. And we did send over the decision by document to Doug Heim who gave us a bunch of feedback. So we, So my understanding is that that's okay as long as it's communicated in advance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Any further questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question if you don't mind? Please, Mr. Valorelli. So um, the uh, legal notices, would they have an option for uh, the participant? Right now, it, it, it says a hearing in regards to the petition will be conducted remotely. So would the uh, legal notice uh, give the uh, petition, give the public an option uh, to join uh, remotely or in person? That's my understanding. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, actually one of the things I'm gonna do is reach out to the committees before, you know, week before your first hybrid and to make sure all those T's are crossed and stuff. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any sense of when you're meeting, the next meeting that you would think it would make sense to do this? So the next, meeting so we have two meetings that are scheduled in november the 22nd is the is the continuation of the 40b and i would not want to do that as a test got it um we do have one coming up that will be on the 15th mm -hmm. um that'll have two items on it um i think as a, we would need to figure out if we think we're going to be ready for that date um i'm a little uncomfortable yep jumping in that quick yep um so i think you know december might be a better option but it might not be a bad idea in november to at least do sort of a you know a dry run meeting yeah with members of the board and to sort of see what happens okay okay just just to let me know when absolutely uh, those those make sense okay are there any further questions from the board seeing none thank you so much for Okay. Coming to us tonight. Sure. I have another meeting to get to, so I'll take, take my leave. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will be definitely be in touch about um, finding a date to do a dry run. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much. You, Mr. Thanks. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Do, do you think that it may be useful to schedule a vote for the 15th so that we can get that formality out of the way? Absolutely. And I can check and see if we've done that already. I just can't recall. Yeah, I don't remember either. I'm sorry. Okay. Very good. Thank you all. With that, uh, go back to our agenda. Uh, the next item is a public hearing. So turning to the public hearings on tonight's agenda, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant or applicants to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then ask members of the board, ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, I will the board will deliberate on the matter. Um, 
And just as a, for, if in case anyone has joined the meeting late um, and is here on to hear the case on 39 Woodside Lane, um, I would just uh, note that the 39 Woodside Lane was uh, continued now until November 15th. Um, there was an acute family emergency on behalf of the applicant and they requested a last second continuance, uh, which we did at the start of the meeting. So um, we will not be hearing 39 Woodside Lane tonight that has been continued to November 15th. So with that goes to item number five on our agenda this evening, which is docket number 3703, 13 Edith Street. So if I could ask the applicant to go ahead and introduce themselves, um, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Jack Foster. I live at 1 Edith Street. I submitted this application with Spencer Renke, uh, who co-owns. This is it's a two uh, two unit property in East Arlington, up and down. Um, and so we co-own the property together, along with our respective spouses. Um, we've submitted an application for a shed dormer. Um, which would go on to the top unit, which is Juanita Street, uh, my residence. Um, I, I don't, I, I've never done one of these before, so I'm not sure what else would be helpful, but I, I did note the memo from the um, Department of Planning and Community Development requested yep. some floor plans and side elevations. I believe those have been included in the, uh, in the reference materials. They were originally included in our application package, but for whatever reason, uh, mm -hmm. didn't are now uploaded uh, with reference. We'll go materials. ahead. Let me go ahead and share the application. Um, then we can. The application. So essentially they are looking to, it's just adding this 653 square feet up on exactly. the third floor. Exactly. The attic floor. Um, so this is the existing front elevation. This is the proposed front elevation. Uh, a view from the corner, existing and proposed. Um, and then this is the plot plan. So there's no change to the plot itself. It's just this side of the house. Exactly. And, um, and I'm, I'm happy to share my screen or, or Mr. Chair, um, whichever your preference is we have. Yes, the floor plans and elevation are, are located here. So this is the existing, uh, will be left side elevation. Um, and then this would be the proposed. And I'm, I'm assuming this line is just where the old Eve line used to be. Yes, I think that's just a demarcation of, um, okay. of, of the prior Eve line and where the floor would be. Yeah. And then this is the proposed floor plan. Um, right, so we're, yes, sir. I was gonna say, go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're looking to add a um, kind of a family room, great room, um, which then enters into a hallway for a master suite. So a bedroom, bath, and a closet. Okay. Um, and, and that's about it, an exit onto a balcony. Um, currently there's a roof over the um, uh, kind of the uh, uh, budding or, or built on office. I guess it's an office on, on the Juanita Street unit currently um, with a roof and so that roof would be replaced with a flat roof and a balcony. Okay. And then um, this is the, where is the... Yeah, that's, that's about it. We've, we've been working with uh, Bob Terrazzoni of High Tech Dormers, who I believe does a lot of the dormers in, in kind of the north, in the you know, kind of Metro West Boston and Arlington, Medford. Um, and so he's, he's been on site. He's been in our attic and he's examined, you know, what we're working with and has given us a proposal. So he's available and is, uh, you know, we're, we've got a, um, a retainer down with him. So hoping to be able to move forward. 
Perfect. I think that this will add a lot of value to the property um, and and increase the um, you know the, the usage for families to increase from a two bedroom to a three bedroom. Okay. So the 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 first thing I, I do want to clarify. I went back and forth with the planning department a little bit about this. Yeah. It's just a, as as a technicality. It's not a dormer. Um, it's you are just you're changing the roof shape basically. It's going from being a you know your regular symmetrical gable to being an asymmetrical gable. I see. Um, so just it doesn't matter one iota except that it's just <laughs> it's just not te technically not a dormer. I um, see. And typically, what we see would typically when we would see this it would be a dormer, and that would there would be a portion of the existing roof that remains. I see. And yes. then you would see you know the the dormer is subservient to the roof. So you would sort of see it as an element in the roof. So this is just a slightly different appearance of that. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. Right, we, we went with, um, with this asymmetrical roof shape as opposed to a, a kind of a standard dormer, which um, mostly for roof, for uh, balcony access, mm -hmm. if you retain the eave shape, I don't think a door way would, would quite fit right, right there. So yeah. we're hoping that the asymmetrical roof line um, will be visually appealing, um, but, but also functional to the, to the great room space. And, um, and I, I did notice in the memo and I agree that the, um, the setback from the front sidewalk and the, um, the addition of a balcony will, will set off the asymmetrical roof from, from the street significantly and we're and we're definitely open to um uh to fencing designs mm -hmm. railing designs uh, that are more modern uh, for the balcony thank you are there questions from the board okay, go back to the original package So this is um, the reason this is coming before the board, um, as we see often, essentially thus <clears throat> the site has zero usable open space. And by the amount of usable open space a property is required to have relates directly to the amount of gross floor area of that building itself. And so as you increase the gross floor area of the house, you're supposed to increase the amount of usable open space this has a non-conformity that it has no usable open space. And the question before the board is, is that it's going, is requiring more usable open space where there's none now, is that creating, is, is that substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the current condition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, this is going to come up eventually anyway, but the, before we get to the what's called the section six finding that you just indicated, whether it would be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing nonconformity, uh, there has to be a finding uh, that uh, there is a uh, extension of the nonconforming use. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion back and forth over time, including the Oxford case that we had last week. Um, generally speaking, ISD by asking for a special permit impliedly finds that there's an extension um, of the non-conforming use. Uh, whether or not that is appropriate in a case like this is something that has come under, under some discussion. This case has been in the pipeline and, and has been pending for a while and, and no one has appealed that determination to us. Um, so I feel sort of bound by the implicit determination that has been made by ISD. Uh, but I do think that, that in substance, it's a serious question whether in a case like this, we should be hearing it at all, as opposed to it being doable as a matter of right. Uh, and I think that view, or at least the view that it's, it's a significant issue is shared by the building inspector. and. I'm hoping eventually that we get to the point where it would be a rare if, if occurrence, if ever, uh, that we would be dealing with cases, uh, uh, cases of this kind.
Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, Mr. Foster, do you know what the roof pitch is? Um, you know what, I would, I would have to calculate that. I know it is greater than the, um, the minimum, but I do not have that exact figure. Okay. I can ask, I can, I, I can get that figure for you shortly though. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately that sheet for some reason is not a part of this application record and I'm not really sure why. Um, I think, I think on the sheets, yeah, I don't, I don't know why they're, let me There's see if I have it on my, yeah. Um, looks, it lo certainly looks to be a pitch that's, that's greater than 2%. So I, I mean, uh, 212. So I think yes, that's, that's, I mean, th that's the figure that we submitted on, uh, page two of the calculation form Yeah, that it's greater than 212, um, as to the exact pitch. I would have to, um, I would have to get that from records. Um, let me see if I have it here. You know, it's simply greater than 212. I should be able to do it from the elevation here. Um, we're going from It's, it's two feet over 12 feet. Yes, if, if that's a figure you'd like, I'd have to, um, I'd have to consult my notes and, and get that for you. Okay. But I know that it is over than two over two two twelve. The only question I had, um, sort of question for the board. So this is to the first case I can recall where rather than it being done as a dormer, the request is to really to raise the entire half of the roof. And the reason that this works here is because the second floor has an enclosed area in the front porch. What would have been the front porch is now enclosed space. And so that counts towards the gross floor area of the second floor. So that they're able to um, raise the entire side in order and still remain within the definition of a half story. Uh, but what this does create which we had seen before in the side here is that you end up, so effectively this, even though this is the existing condition, this is sort of the mirror of what the right side of the house is gonna look like. So the right side of the house is a two story, but the left side of the house is gonna functionally be a three story building. Um, and I just, so it'll have a very tall facade. So I just, wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Typically, if we were to have a dormer, you would still have the eave line that would be continuing above the, the row of second windows, which would sort of break that break up the massing a little bit between um, the main part of the house and the, the addition into the attic. And so, I, you know, as Mr. Hanlon had said, you know, essentially, you know, the, there are, there is, there's definitely an interpretation of the zoning bylaw and there are discussions going on that this kind of um, a request because of the way that bylaws are written could be considered uh, something that could be approved by right. I did want to bring it to the board's attention because as a special permit, we're allowed to sort of continue uh, consider the application of the, of the residential design guidelines. And so the question is, is you know, to be to be blunt, does this does this bother anyone? Does anybody think that this is detrimental having a straight three story facade, um, you know, facing an, another house directly next door? Mr. Chair, Ms. Hoffman, um, I wouldn't say that it bothers me, but I guess I have a follow up question, which is because it at with the current um, proposal it would um, still be a half story. 
but it's kind of locking the building in to being asymmetrical. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at, but that is kind of an interesting situation that it, um, it wouldn't really be possible to do the same intervention on the opposite side. That is correct. So that from the, the, this move could not happen on this side. And there's really not any additional space left over to do any kind of dormering on this side. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't know if there's any other follow-up comments, but I'd be happy to address uh, those, those concerns. Sure. Uh, I'd also like to respond to your question about the pitch. It's it is exactly a two twelve. Okay, perfect. Thank um, you. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I think in this current configuration, we're maxing out. We're at forty six percent of um, the 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 of the floor plan below. So we're you know four percent shy. I guess you could open up a window or something. Um, on the other side and, and not, you know, create more square footage, but create a little bit more of, um, uh, uh, you know, symmetricality, if you'd like, down the road. Um, but I'd also note that our next door, immediate next door neighbor to the left, uh, the, the Latermans, I believe they submitted a letter stating that, um, that they approve of this design as the most directly affected individual party. Um, and as and the configuration of the house, we, we selected this side so that this, you know, the, the um, kind of the creation of three stories, um, which I have seen around town at a, at a number of houses that, you know, so the Eve line is, is not uniformly maintained, but uh, we put it on the left side so that it would not be visible from the corner, from the predominant um, lines of sight on Margaret Street. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, are there any further questions from the board? Not Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I, I'm just trying to summarize uh, for myself. So, I mean, in terms of the half story calculation, everything is fine. In terms of the pitch yep. of the roof, everything is fine. So really the issue becomes one of aesthetics in terms of like the residential guide, design guidelines. Would you, would you agree with that? So that, yes. So, so we're really talking, and I think that the applicant has just addressed it by saying that the next door neighbor who would be most directly affected by it has no objection and approves of it. Mm -hmm. But I guess the question, and I'm not an architect um, like many of you, but in the event that you wanted not to have that, that roof be raised for the entire uh, length or width, whatever it is of the house, in, to, in order to create a dormer, you'd essentially just be cutting off, you know, a couple of parts, uh, you know, spaces on the ends of each of the roof line, right? So that it would have more of the appearance of a dormer. Exactly. And, and, and that would be really the only thing that would give any visual relief as far as that's concerned. And I, so I'm just trying to understand that that would really be the only option and, and I guess it's, I'm not sure that it's anything mm -hmm. that we could insist upon anyway, but that's really the issue, is it not? It is, and the, the applicant had sort of made this, this statement at the start, which is very true, that in order to have, you know, a good flowing access out onto the, the deck above the second floor um, at the front of the building, if the existing roof line remained, there really isn't space to come out 
to, that the door would be impacted, you know, the door would be in the roof framing. So in order to do, to make full use of that area on the third, on the, you know, the, the attic level, essentially at the front, it's in shifting, uh, rotating up that piece of the roof is sort of somewhat critical to make that happen. Thanks, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, Mr. Absolutely. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I'm hoping that we maybe get some more elucidation from the public hearing, but in any event, I wanted to raise I mean, the, 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 whether this is a dormer or whether it's changing the shape of the roof is not a matter of concern under the zoning bylaw as such. It is just a question ultimately of whether this is a, the extension of the nonconformity here uh, is increases the detriment to the neighborhood. Um, but because we do the, the uh, we put this into the special permit uh, framework, we do have from, I, from uh, the planning department, a comment on how they think at least the residential design guidelines apply. Um, and they are relatively bullish on this. Uh, they mentioned that that covered porches and and uh, these kinds of things are common in this neighborhood, and that uh, they think that the addition will complement the style of the existing structure in the adjacent homes in the neighborhood. And while the proposal will increase the structure's massing, the addition is set back from Edith Street and partly shielded by the proposed open porch, which is um, a statement that Mr. Foster already makes. So their conclusion is that it wouldn't detrimentally impact the neighborhood character of the district or adjoining districts, um, which is, I think, consistent with what the letter we have from the neighbor most directly affected uh, uh, says. So uh, there's, I'm not, I'm not unduly disturbed by this. It seems to me that uh, it's an issue that, that comes up sometimes when we deal with cases of this and it's only kind of peripherally related to the extension of the open space nonconformity, uh, which is what we're supposed to be focused on. But in any way, applying the residential guidelines is always subjective and different people can have different views, but the planning department seems to be uh, relaxed about this. Thank you. Any further from the board? Just to, not to share. This is Vinke. Oh yeah, he's Vinke. Hey, um, one question I had um, was on a, on page eight of the site plan. Let me go back to that. The Twelve foot seven inch dimension is the new. I just want to understand what that twelve foot seven inch dimension is shown. Um, running east west of the page. This here. Yeah. My my understanding, Mr. Chair, is that that is the um, the affected the, the affected length of of um, essentially the left side of the house from the ridge line of the roof to uh, the existing overhang into the overhang. So that's the section where the roof will be lifted. Okay, so it's effectively half the width of the house. Yes. Okay. But um, back on the calculations, there's 15 foot five inch shown as the width of the building. So uh, it's just uh... ah, right. So if you if you go to the floor plan, um, based on I believe the the seven foot height calculation, yeah, um, that extends a few feet, three feet past the um, onto the right side of the house. So if, if you imagine the ridge line is uh, where where the wall is between the hallway or the or the yeah. bedroom and the closet, that's the ridge line. Uh, so that uh, seven foot space extends three feet over. So that's where you get the fifteen. But wouldn't the area of the floor below be the entire width of it? Which is okay. Yeah, and then the floor below includes the area that on the third floor is the balcony. So that's right. That is offsetting. Right. So that allows the this to be more than 50% of the main volume of the house. Right. Right. Because the width is what 25 feet or 24 something. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere in that range. Yeah. Right. 
go ahead and stop the share and we're going to be opening the meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the public comment period will be closed. With that, are there any members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Which is the hearing for one three Edith Street. Well, one more chance. Anyone wishing to address this hearing? Let's see none. So I'll go ahead and close the public comment period. Okay, so what is before the board? This is a, a request to um, create an attic, uh, excuse me, an addition at the attic floor level, uh, which would take place on one side of uh, the existing house. And as the applicant has said, um, high tech dormer, they will basically take the existing roof plane and tilt it up um, and then uh, reframe underneath it. So it will create an, an asymmetrical roof form. Um, and as the applicant has said, partly that's um, to enable better access to get out on top of the um, the existing addition that's on the front of the building, uh, which is a, an office space on the second floor, and it would be an open deck on the third floor. Um, this comes before the board because it is technically increasing the existing nonconformity with regards to usable open space. Um, <clears throat> and so the board typically applies the criteria for a special permit um, in its review and then um, as this is a special, uh, technically considered a, a chapter six, um, excuse me, a section six determination, the board needs to make a determination that the, the change is not significantly more detrimental to the neighborhood than the current condition. Um, so are there any questions from the board in regards to what we're doing? So should the board uh, vote to approve this application? Are there any conditions that members of the board feel would be appropriate? The board does have three um, typical The board has three typical uh, standard uh, conditions which would apply, which I'll go ahead and read into the record. The first standard condition, number one, plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, standard number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that he's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time it is determined that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And standard number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. So are there uh, any additional conditions which members of the board feel would be appropriate this time? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, sorry to interrupt. One, one, one question. Um, does condition one, does that apply mm -hmm. to internal floor plans as well? So the demarcation of 
uh, no. internal walls, number of, you know, if, we, if we're looking to drop half a bath. Yeah, no, I, I, the, the interior wouldn't matter to, wouldn't, okay. wouldn't be a material to the board. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So with that, um, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the board approve the application subject to the standard conditions that the chair just read into the record. Second. Ms. Hanlon, thanks, Mr. DuPont. Are there any questions from the board? This is a vote to approve the special permit for 13 Edith Street with three conditions. Seeing none, roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The special permit for 13 Edith Street is approved. Thank you very much, members of the chair and, and Mr. Welcome. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. With that, I'll move to item number six on our agenda, which is docket 3718, which is 24 Langley Road. Um, so I would ask the applicant to introduce themselves and I will uh, go ahead and load up the, the documents for this hearing. Uh, I'm, I'm Faith Baum, I'm the architect for the project and I think Herb Sweeney, the owner is here. Yes, hello, my name is Herb Sweeney. Uh, I am uh, the resident at 24 Langley and uh, my family and I have been residents here for I think seven years now, really love our neighborhood. Um, we're looking to make some improvements to our house, including uh, a porch on the south face to improve access and circulation. Um, and as uh, Faith noted, we've engaged Faith Baum Architects uh, to assist in the design of this uh, feature. And if it's acceptable uh, to the chair, I would like to have uh, Faith walk through the design and uh, the features of the application. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Baum, do you have a presentation you want to present or do you want me to I, go I think, ahead? I think we, I'd like to go through the drawings and it was my understanding that you have the drawings. <laughs> we do. Yes. The one, oh, one more sheet. Okay, so uh, on this drawing, uh, you'll see the uh, uh, on the left side or on facing the camp that's existing, and on the other side is the proposed. And what we're asking to this, this house is situated on a corner lot. As you can see, Crosby Street and Langley Road surround the house, and on the south side, we are hope what well, we're doing two additions, but, but the one in question right now is that porch on the south side. We um, are asking that uh, the setback, it's considered a, rare, a rear um, yard, but in fact, it functionally is a side yard. And because the property has so many front yards, we are hoping to um, place this uh, porch on that side of the house. So if you look at the next drawing, um, this shows uh, the foundation plan. Uh, beneath the porch will be a unfinished storage space in that the lot in section on the um, east side is at a higher, almost a story higher than it is on the, on the um, west side. So on the wet, this storage, unfinished storage space, which you can see in the proposed basement plan will be accessed at the lower elevation. So can you take the next drawing? And um, you can see that there's a covered porch and to provide access directly to the kit through the kitchen uh, for the kids and, um, you know, to access the exterior space. And uh, it's a picks up in terms of its roof, the existing roof, and you can see that in the elevations. So if we can go to the elevations, um, this is just a sec two cross sections through that covered porch, and um, it's got a center um, entrance. In the next slide, 
these are the elevations. The existing is above and the proposed is below. So facing these drawings on the left side is the little porch and it picks up on that existing um, pent roof. I call it a pent roof um, that wraps the entire house. So it's sort of a continuation aesthetically of that house. In terms of setback, uh, the required setback for a rear yard is 20 feet. And um, we are at this time um, setting it back um, 13 feet uh, and change. So this would be fine if it was a side yard, but because by it is defined as a rear yard, we are, um, we are here to ask for that special permit. Next slide, please. I mean, the next image, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. This is um, the view, for, as you can see, from the, the lower west um, side of the house. Uh, right now, it's kind of torturous to get up into the kitchen, whereas we were looking for uh, our proposal is a much more natural, easy um, access from the high grade. And um, the, uh, this side shows uh, the addition, which is in compliance and not part of the discussion. Next, next slide. Um, next, well, picture uh, plan. This is uh, a view from the north side, which um, looks at the more functional side of the house, the garage side. There'll be a uh, air handler there and not much view and there's no porch here whatsoever. So it's really not really relevant. Next slide. And this is the front elevation of the porch. And you can see right now uh, we're moving that um, uh, the, the uh, compressor to the other side of the house and putting this porch there. We are basically, the house is uh, layered in three layers on the elevation. The lowest elevation is a rough stone um, rubble foundation. It, above that sits a brick, brick uh, area. And then there's that pent roof and then it becomes siding. And so our intention is to just to continue the rubble at the base of the porch and then have the porch just sit at the brick uh, a brick facade and then continue the pent roof. And then finally, I think the last one, yeah, this just shows that pretty much every house in the neighborhood has this condition of sort of being framed a center, a center facade, a center mass with two small one story um, uh, pieces framing that center. So one story porches flanking the main body of the house the front entry is centered on that mass and that there's a scale change that's created by this porch, uh, this proposed porch addition. And, and the, uh, it does not impact negatively the pedestrian um, uh, circulation. And in fact, I think it improves the way the house can be used uh, in, in relationship to, to, to tightening the, um, the relationship to the neighborhood. And so that's, that's, I think that's everything. <laughs> Great, well, thank you very much. Let me jump back to... Oh, and these are letters that were um, provided by the neighbors who are happy with this addition. Perfect, thank you. Um, so just to refresh the board, so this is the, <clears throat> the corner um, and it's just this piece here. Exactly. And by definition, because this is a front yard and this is a front yard everything has to have a rear yard. So this is the rear yard. Um, and as, the, as, as Ms. Baum said, the 13.7 feet is the proposed distance from the edge of the porch uh, to the property line, where currently, uh, I believe this says 22.3 is the, is the current rear yard depth. And then um, there's this, are some letters from Abutters, um, is that 19 Langley Road? In support. For 167 Crosby Street, also in support. It's just a applications, there's no change to the gross floor area. It is just a, the porch and going 
existing rear yard of 22.3 would have the, the porch extending into it. Are there any questions from the board? Any questions from the board? Seeing none. Very, very straightforward application. Um, with that, I will go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. Um, as stated before, um, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose, purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public who wish to speak can digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab. And if you're calling in by phone, you may dial star nine. Um, with that, um, you have Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I'd like to ask the applicant through you, um, did I hear correctly that there's a plan to establish a foundation under this porch? Uh, Ms. Baum? Yes, there is a foundation under the porch. Uh, there, there, there is not now a foundation there. You'll be adding the foundation, correct? Yeah, it will carry the porch. To carry, it will take the load of the roof down to the ground, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so it is a new it is a new foundation system for the right. Well, oh, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. let me ask you then. Um, my understanding is the way these porches work that, based on the fact there would be a foundation there, that in the future, the applicant could now build straight up from that new foundation at a later date. Is that correct or am I wrong? That was until um, May 11th, I believe, is the official date. Uh, so town meeting voted um, an amendment to the zoning bylaws uh, at the spring, this spring. And one of the amendments is that um, any porch is not considered to be within the foundation wall of the house. And therefore any, uh, any enclosure um, or building upon it uh, would require an additional special permit. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've, I, I noted that there's been significant, not abuse, but almost misuse of that around town. So I'm glad that was casting no aspersions on this applicant, by the way. Yeah. Just I'm glad I'm glad town meeting fixed it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, I noticed a significantly large tree on the property uh, where these, the, not the addition that you're talking about tonight, but the other addition. Um, and I'm hoping you're going to protect that and come up with a tree plan to perhaps talk to the tree warden about. Herb, do you want to talk about that? Herb's a landscape architect. Yes, yeah, of course. Um, so there is a large lilac um, off the southeast corner. Uh, sorry, southwest corner of the, the property. And one of the uh, major considerations with this um, uh, uh, improvement to the house was to not impact that existing lilac. Um, so it's not a, it's not a tree, but it is a very large shrub and it will be <laughs> retained. Uh, that's a significant goal. Um, as I am a professional landscape architect is one of the most important aspects of the garden. Is that this? Oh, uh, <laughs> off the, that's, a, that is a dogwood. It's off the okay. Northwest corner and it would not be impacted by, uh, okay. the South. Um, the Western expansion as well. Okay. That's also lovely. I like the lilac more though. <laughs> and I, I think the absence of trees in the proposed plan is just that none of the trees are, are transposed. It's not that the trees are being removed. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we did that so that you could read the dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, sure. and if, the, if the question, Steve, you had was of the um, state champion uh, honey locust on the northern side, absolutely. We do everything we can to keep that um, surviving since that's about, who knows, 100 and some years old at this point. Yeah, Mr. Chair, that was the tree I was thinking about. It looks magnificent. And uh, that's of always particular interest to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Uh, so these are, I believe that would be this tree. Here's the. Yeah, your cursor's not showing. Oh, 
Oh, well. Uh, it's a lower image on the left hand side, I think, is the tree. So left in this view to the left of the house is the is that tree. Yeah, Mr. Chair, it's more obvious in the picture at the end of the planning board's document, I believe. Or, okay. I'm sorry, maybe in the package. There was a photograph. Oh, 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 okay. Let me switch back to that then. Yeah, it's on the front elevation or the side. Ah, got it. It would be to the left of that image that you just had up. Oh, okay. This one here? Uh, uh, that, right, yeah, picture. that is, that's the honey locust. That, okay. It's about four foot oh. diameter. Oh, wow. Okay. Are there any? Stop the share. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the hearing for public comment. Um, so what the board has before it is a request um, to uh, construct a porch in the rear yard setback. Um, and this is something that the, the board can grant through special permit. Um, the we have from the planning board, their memorandum. They addressed a special permit criteria um, that it be granted by special permit, um, which improves the convenience and safety of the owner's secondary entrance to the home, will not create undue traffic, will not create an undue burden on the municipal systems, um, would not result in the need for a special regulation um, that while the porch exceeds the maximum square footage allowable by right, they're a common feature as the, um, as the architect has demonstrated. Um, and it's consistent with residential design guidelines in terms of improving the overall streetscape, adding visual interest and uh, breaking up the massing of the property. So, and then the, the seventh criteria would be uh, de any detrimental excesses of any particular use. And that would not be the case here. Um, and again, this is the view from the front, the nice tree over here. And it, this is sort of looking from the, be the back rear, back right corner, excuse me, um, the house. that. Are there any further questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Holly. Probably I'm missing something here for sure. Um, there is on sheet is some addition being talked about. We're not discussing in this hearing about that addition, correct? Or, uh, correct. It's just correct. the porch addition. The other addition is by right. But um, okay, that's the reason why the area summary sheets do not include that addition calculations and stuff and no changes being called out. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I don't exactly know. I've been looking at the version of our bylaw that is published and that is amended by special town meeting through May 11th, uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. And the amendment that I remember town meeting making to the provision that's at issue here um, is not reflected in that document. Um, and I'm a little bit unclear as to, as, as I recall, the, those amendments actually passed in annual town meeting uh, and not special town meeting, although that may be wrong. But I recall the number, the date being in June, and I, I'm wondering whether I'm just having a question about what document is actually the document that uh, has been approved and, and is, is in force. But the language that is in the one thing that I downloaded uh, after I heard that the uh, 
Attorney General had approved it, uh, seems to me to reflect to be essentially the language that uh, existed before the change. And I just I, I I just noticed this for the first time, and I am a little perplexed by it and by what, if anything, we should yeah. be doing about it. Let's see. I believe it's five three nine. Right. This is on page on page five six of district and uses. Six, thank you. And the first sentence there in what I'm reading is projecting eaves, chimneys, bay windows, balconies, open fire escapes, and enclosed entrances, not more than 25 square feet, and so forth. And the word porches was supposed to be inserted into that sentence. Uh, it is that way in the warrant article, uh, but it doesn't appear to be in this, be that way in the consolidated document. Strange. Oh, no wonder I'm having trouble. I'm looking at the wrong version. Um, I had looked through this. I had thought it had been caught correctly, um, but I can look, I can, um, let's see if I can find this real quick. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that the attorney general approved what we submitted. They, she certainly, or she didn't, certainly didn't disapprove anything. And we've been applying it as was enacted by town meeting for some time now. So I wouldn't want to have Mr. Foster's case tied up in all of this, but we are, I, I guess that we, we need to follow up and make sure that uh, the document that's in the public domain is right. And for all I know, I may have downloaded some intermediate version and it's already been corrected, but I was surprised not to find the word porches uh, where I expected it. Yeah, no, because I had viewed this as well. Let me um the porches yeah, is, is there. Right, yeah. Where porches is there. And then down here is porches and enclosed entrances may extend into the minimum yard regulation. So that was what was in the final recommendation from the ARB. Is that, is this the, this isn't, is this the official, is this the consolidated document? So this That's is- what it should be is, I, I'm, I'm sure of that. Yeah. And I'm, what so I this is what I just, this is what's available now on the town's website. Okay. Then I must've gotten an intermediate version that's been- That could be. And as far as I'm aware, none of this has been approved by the Attorney General's office yet, but under state law, it is um, it is the, the zoning by law from the time it's enacted. And it's only, if, struck, if stricken by the Attorney General, then it's stricken retroactively. Yeah, I think that we have actually received a memorandum from the planning department that the Attorney General has approved this. So I think we're okay. Oh, okay. I don't know. I stopped carrying the paper of record, so I, I haven't been able to, I haven't checked to see if it was actually published in it as it was supposed to be published, so. All right. So were the board to vote to approve, uh, we would impose the standard three conditions, which we'd read into the record earlier. Are there any additional, um, conditions which board members feel would be appropriate for this application? Seeing none. Um, is there any further questions on this in regards to this application? I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. 
Uh, I move that the application be approved subject to the standard uh, conditions which the chair has previously read into the record. Thank you, Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. What the board has before it, this is a vote to approve a special permit for 24 Langley Road with the three standard conditions. As motioned by Mr. Hanlon and seconded by Mr. DuPont, are there any questions from the board as to what we're voting on? Seeing none, a roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. The chair votes aye. A uh, motion to approve the special permit for 24 Langley Road with three conditions is approved. Thank you all very much for- Thank you very much. Thank you guys. welcome. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Good night. Good night. So with that, I um, just want to review our uh, upcoming <clears throat> meetings and uh, per Ms. O'Connor's uh, note at the start of the meeting, I went back into the state law. So. Indeed, under chapter 40A, section 11, second paragraph, it says, no, it talks about the uh, notice requirements for public hearings, party of interest defined, yada, yada. It says, no such hearing shall be held on any day on which a state or municipal election, caucus, or primary is held in such city or town. So the board is not allowed to meet on November 8th under state law. Um, so, the continuation of 39 Woodside will happen on the 15th of November and uh, Mr. Vellarelli will need to let the applicants for Melrose Street know that as well. Uh, will do Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I don't know if we need to do any kind of a particular notice. Um, but I think we can discuss how to do that. Um, so that would be November 15th. After that, we do have a meeting scheduled for a hearing scheduled for November 22nd, which is the continuation of the comprehensive permit application for the residences at Mill Brook. Um, at the time we had proposed the topic would be sort of traffic and transportation and parking. Um, that is still the plan. I am not, I had asked the planning department for an update on where we are with, uh, uh, retaining consultants. Um, I have not heard back from them today, so I'm not entirely sure where that is. Uh, but the, the hope had been that the, we would have consultants on board who could review that and provide us feedback um, and also provide feedback to the applicant before the hearing. So we'll uh, keep working with them on that. Um, and then the board's two typical dates for December would be um, December 13 and December 27. Um, and so I just wanted to confirm with the board that those dates are good or see if there was any interest in um, changing those dates up, up a week. So it would be the 6th and the 20th rather than the 13th and the 27th. That, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, Subject to, if I had my brothers in the occasion, I think moving them up a little bit and not having a meeting in the period between Christmas and New Year's is a help because lots of people are not around in, during that period of time. And um, so it, it, that might be marginally better. I agree with that. I, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, Rick, if I could have you make a note of that, that if we're meeting in December, the dates would be the 6th and the 20th. Uh, already did, Mr. Chairman. Perfect. Um, anything, any, anything else for the board? Um, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Mr. Moore. Um, you folks had talked about doing a walkthrough of the 40B property. Uh, I'm wondering if that has occurred or is that scheduled for the future? That has not been scheduled yet. Okay. We're, it, it's partially being held up because we don't have the consultants yet and we had wanted okay. to do it with right. the consultants. So. Great. Thank you. Mr. Once, it, once that is going to happen, it needs to be publicly noticed because it would be open to a quorum of the board. And that would appear on the town calendar like all the regular meetings? It would. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. You're welcome. 
All right, well, with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Linema, Marissa Lau for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So a vote to adjourn. Roll call vote, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so very much for being here tonight. Thank you guys. Nice job. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Take care, everyone. Have a happy Halloween. <laughs> you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. See, see y'all later. Yeah. Take care.